Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kelly of Lean Frontiers and I will serve as your host today. Just a few points of logistics before we get started. Today's short presentation is being recorded, so look for an email shortly after this recording with a link to view the session on demand. Please share it with those in your organization and perhaps even use the recording as part of a lunch and learn. Due to the short nature of this webinar, we will not be fielding questions. If you do have questions, our presenter will share their email address and you can email the presenter directly. Today's webinar is lead up to the Lean Leadership Week, which takes place September 12th and 13th in Austin, Texas. Please consider joining us for this event as we have an incredible lineup of speakers you're not going to want to miss. Lean Leadership Week is a week full of opportunity as we offer the Lean Accounting and Management Summit and the Lean HR and People Development Summit. You can learn more about the summit by visiting leanfrontiers.com forward slash L-A-M-S registration forward slash. So with that said, let me introduce our presenter today, Drew Locker. Drew has been practicing continuous improvement and facilitating major change efforts for 35 years in a wide variety of business environments. He is an instructor for the University of Michigan Lean Leadership and Toyota Kata Certificate Programs and a faculty member of the Lean Enterprise Institute since 2001. Drew is a four-time author and two-time Shingo Prize recipient, as well as a frequent speaker at conferences in the U.S. and abroad. So for now, I'll hand it over to Drew. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending uh, this little webinar on a topic of great interest to me and hopefully of you. Uh, it's titled The Psychology of Learning, What It Really Takes to Develop Skills and Habits. This is very important for leaders to understand what it really takes so they can have reasonable expectations. So let's get started. So these are comments that I hear from folks, uh, typically in leadership roles uh, in my travels. We can't find good help. Everyone went to a class. Uh, on the job training is the best way to learn. And uh, usually these comments lead to this one. I don't see why people just don't get it. <laughs> and what they're referring to is whatever it is they're expected to learn. It could be a specific job, skill, uh, or position, uh, or very often, it's skills for problem solving and process improvement, uh, which is really what we're after with Lean Enterprise, developing a culture of continuous improvement where people are coming in every day thinking, how do we get a little bit better than yesterday, last week, last month, last quarter, last year? And if we can get the vast majority of our folks, our team members thinking this way, then we truly have achieved the ultimate objective, which is creating a culture of continuous improvement. Uh, so usually these uh, expressions on the screen here are representative of frustration. They're just manifestations of frustration that leaders are, are conveying to me. Uh, I usually respond with, do you really understand what it takes for people to learn, uh, create skill, and ultimately habit? And it's habit what we're after when we're talking about a culture change. So a little history. I didn't make up the term, the psychology of learning. It actually comes from a publication that dates back to 1913 uh, from a gentleman uh, named Edward Thorndike. And Edward Thorndike has been referred to as the founder of educational psychology. I always like to you know, give a little history of where these things come from. So really what I'm saying here is we've known for 100 years, over 100 years, what it really takes to develop skill and ultimately habit and in general to learn. I also believe from my own studies and research that this is the foundation for training within industries or TWI, specifically job instruction or JI. I've often referred to JI as the foundation of lean. Uh, people often refer to standardized work as a foundation, but there's a foundation to the foundation and that's TWI's job instruction or JI methodology. Uh, it originated not just in World War II, as many people think, but actually its origins date back to World War I. And I do believe uh, they come really from Dr. Edward Thorndike. Hmm. Having trouble. There we go. 
So we often refer to the mother of all improvement methodologies uh, as plan, do, check, act, or PDCA. Dr. Deming brought this methodology to the world really going back to the 1950s. Uh, some people refer to his plan, do, study, act. That's commonly found in healthcare. Uh, so I'll just kind of use what I learned, which is PDCA. PDCA, in its basic essence, is a learning cycle. We take what we've learned and apply it uh, to continuously improve processes or to solve problems that can also improve performance. We always want to kind of think of the spirit of PDCA as a learning cycle. Uh, back to the psychology of learning, we, it consists of four laws. You know, when, Dr., when Edward Thorndike was creating this new uh, science, everything is a law. So he refers to all these things as laws. So it's probably a stretch to use the term. Uh, the law of readiness, the law of exercise, the law of effect, and the law of habit. And together, these are, need to be understood and practiced in order to maximize the effectiveness of learning and also the efficiency of learning. Uh, and as you see on the last law, the law of habit, that's really what we're after, where people can more naturally, you know, with less effort and thought, practice problem solving and process improvement. So let's uh, take a look at each of these laws in more detail. First, the law of readiness. Fact is, people must be ready to learn. If they're not ready, they will have, uh, often do things to put an end to the learning process. Uh, at the very least, they will be annoyed <laughs> with the learning process, and therefore the learning will be less effective. So again, think of plan, do, check, act, where we're about to you know, maybe pull a team of people together to solve a problem or improve a process or performance of a process. If the folks that we're pulling together are not ready to learn, then we're going to have difficulty. Uh, they mentally will not be, be ready and we can push forward through this, or at least try to, but it won't be very effective. So the question I often ask uh, organizations or leaders in organizations is, are you, you know, or what are you doing to ready your people for change, which all problem solving and process improvement represents? And very often, I don't get a very good answer or no answer at all. Uh, so how can an organization help ready its people? Well, first, uh, they have to make sure that the person is ready mentally and emotionally. It's not just about carving out time for the learning process. So very often leaders tell me, uh, we're, we're giving them time to work on this. And that's great, you know, don't get me wrong, but what else are you doing to make sure that the individual or individuals that are involved are mentally and emotionally ready? Uh, so, how often have you had personal conversations to understand a person's readiness for learning prior to even starting a, you know, a substantial or significant improvement initiative or problem solving initiative? And what I often hear is there's very few personal one-on-one -on -one conversations. I always speak to folks and it's amazing what they will tell you. They may be telling you things that are happening in their home lives. Uh, that are going to be major distractions to uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, just piling on other, uh, you know, burdens on the person at that time just isn't going to work uh, very well. Their, their minds are elsewhere, and, and rightfully so. If they're concerned with things going on at home, you know, to try to ask them to engage fully in an improvement effort probably isn't going to work so well. Another part of readiness that organizations have to uh, consider is providing an adequate purpose for any proposed change um, and make sure that the people accept that purpose. So humans don't change for the sake of changing. Uh, they need a reason. Humans have been in search of reasons for thousands and thousands of years, and we have to give them a reason. So uh, today I was facilitating uh, the first day of a value stream mapping event. And we started off after some education on the topic, uh, not just value stream mapping, but lean in general. Uh, when we got to you know, beginning mapping out their current state, we started with a 
discussion on why this is so important, why we're looking at this particular process or value stream and what the what the purpose was, the potential benefits for them and the overall organization. Uh, only then can people you know, really put their heads and their hearts into it, not just their, their bodies uh, and showing up. And frankly, without purpose, people are most likely to stick with the status quo. You want me to change? Give me a reason. Otherwise, I'm quite happy doing things the way I've been doing them for years. So have organizations adequately provided purpose you know, to the individuals or teams of individuals that are about to embark on a problem solving or process improvement initiative. Next is the law of exercise. And that actually is comprised of two concepts, the law of use and the law of disuse. The law of use involves making connections between a situation and a response. If I didn't forewarn you, this presentation is going to be a bit of psychology 101. Uh, but we're dealing with people, so we've got to we've got to go down that path. For learning to occur, the response must occur in the presence or or very soon after a stimulus is presented. Now the strength of the connection increases with repeated and vigorous practice. The stronger the connection, the greater the probability for recurrence. And therefore, you can start thinking about how with more and more exercise uh, habits. Uh, become possible. So we'll talk a little bit more in depth of the, each of these points coming up. So think about how often an organization has provided training without adequate opportunity to practice what was learned shortly after. I often get requests to do training, you know, volume training. We need you to train 100 people in lean or lean office or whatever the topic may be. And I'll always ask, what opportunities will they have to practice after the training? And they're talking about classroom training, uh, usually in that context. And often the, the organization says, well, we haven't really thought about that. We just want to do some awareness training, uh, get people up to speed. And I'll say, well, that's all well and good. Awareness is a good thing. You have to start somewhere. But don't expect people to be able to walk out of that training, whether it be an hour or eight hours or even 16 hours. Do not expect them to be able to actually practice. Some individuals might, but they're the exception. Most people will not. We have to give them opportunities to deliberately practice. Uh, and I often will push back to these organizations and say, you know, are you sure you want to do this if we don't have the ability to support the practical application? Because if they don't use it, they will lose it. That's an expression in our language. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. And it's very, very true with skill development and learning in general. It's called fading theory. Uh, most people, on average, will forget what they learned. About 70% of it, they will forget in about a two-week period of time. Now, there's a lot that goes into that, uh, whether it, they lose more or less or in shorter periods or longer periods of time. But generally, you know, the point is still well made. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Uh, people will forget what they have not applied. So we always, always, always want to make sure that training is application based and we want that to be real application. That's where the real learning and retention occurs. So think about just classroom only or classroom based training. You know, very often that's what people are doing. That's what they depend on to kind of develop the awareness. But that's not where skill will be developed. And, and leaders of organizations need to understand that. I mean, really, how is skill developed? It's, it's with the practical application on real world processes and problems uh, and then repeating that application. That's really where skill is developed. Classroom, we can introduce terms you know, concepts, all good. People will retain some of that. Um, but without really practice, 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 uh, this, that a lot of that will be lost. Uh, and that's, again, the essence of fading theory. Well, how much practice does it take? That's a common question I get, especially when we start with these conversations. And I'll say about four to seven repetitions are required to put any kind of learning to short-term memory, short-term memory. 
Now, again, a lot goes into these numbers. It depends on the nature of what they're learning. If it's very complex, it could take more repetitions. It's very simple. It could be on the low end, uh, the four. Uh, it also depends over what period of time. If I'm only practicing four times in a year, it's probably going to take more for me to develop the requisite skills and in turn create the habits. Uh, so it could take several years if all I'm able to do is practice four times a year. It also depends on the other things that I'm doing. Uh, it's been referred to as an interruption theory. If I'm very focused and these repetitions are not interrupted by other, other work, other distractions, then the learning process is much more effective. But generally speaking, and you can try this yourself, a minimal of four to seven repetitions to begin to put something to short-term memory. That's not a habit. We're not even close to that. We're just talking where you can start to feel a little comfortable with the, the learning and the skill that you are trying to develop. Uh, so you can do this with like a, a series of numbers, phone numbers, repeat it four times to yourself, and then an hour, two hours later, see if you recall it. Most often you will. Okay, so four to seven minimum. And when I bring those numbers out, leaders usually are like, oh, we didn't think it was that much. Because uh, I often will ask, you know, okay, over what period of time, how many repetitions of actual practice will an individual have? And it's usually one to four a year. Uh, you know, people have been involved in a value stream mapping event, maybe a few Kaizen events, uh, you know, maybe an A3 or two. When you add it up, it's like four a year, and that's going to take more, uh, more than seven probably repetitions to begin to create those skills, where we can go about these things in a much uh, you know, less uh, painfully thoughtful way. All right, so, and this is true of any learning, and I'm emphasizing problem solving and process improvement because that's what we're after with Lean, but it's any type of learning, any uh, knowledge or even, you know, kind of tactile skill this is the kind of what you need. Now, also is the law of effect. And that connection that we talked about, that stimulus response connection, we can increase if people have a satisfying or positive experience. I, you know, people today were like, you seem to keep bringing up, you know, I want you to have a positive experience because it's well known uh, for 100 years or longer that humans will avoid negative experiences. No one wants to repeat negative experiences, but they will want to repeat positive experiences. So even if you are practicing the law of exercise with you know, rap, uh, numerous repetitions, if they're negative repetitions, you, you probably will say, I really don't want to do this uh, in time, even if you're being forced to do it. So we want people to have a positive experience. Now that might sound obvious, but organizations don't always get that uh, and put in place, you know, circumstances, conditions to make sure that we do have a positive experience with regard to change efforts in general. Now, by positive, I do not mean that everything, you know, all change that we do, improvements that we try to affect, uh, doesn't mean they're all successful. Uh, you know, sometimes, and we tell folks, you know, PDCA, it's a learning cycle. There's a spirit of experimentation to it. Uh, we do the do of PDCA as an experiment, and we don't know that the change that we're going to uh, try is going to be effective until we check. Uh, and that's why we don't typically roll out a change across the board until we have verified the effectiveness of that change. Then we do the act to make standard, the A of PDCA. So let's say we do an experiment and it does not have the effect that we had hypothesized, that we had thought was gonna happen. That doesn't mean that's a negative experience. We have to turn that around. Leaders in particular have to emphasize, hey, sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. Sometimes we have to explain to people, it's about the learning. What did we learn from that experience? And as long as we're using that learning and moving forward, it's a positive thing. Uh, but again, the, the response of leaders to where we're not achieving expected results has got to emphasize that, that, that the learning, the PDCA learning cycle and the positiveness of learning. Because most people see learning as a very positive thing. But if we kind of emphasize, you know, failure and lack of success, then people are going to feel negative emotions 
and frankly, they're not going to want to repeat this, uh, this experience. So think about this, you know, how do we um, engage folks? Do we impose particular concepts on people without adequately involving them? I've seen this countless times. Everyone must do visual management. Everyone must have standard work. Here's your standard work. Here's your board to use for visual management. We impose these concepts on people. And when people ask why, remember they need purpose. Often it's just because that's what we're gonna do or this is how we do it and lean. And that's, those are inadequate purposes. But what also happens is people have a negative experience, sometimes so bad that the, the water is spoiled on that particular concept. And it could be very basic things like 5S, if you're familiar with 5S. Uh, if we don't go about the approach you know, and approach uh, the uh, application of these concepts, it could really lead to a negative uh, experience and then people just don't want to do it. Sometimes we force fit the approach that we've used in other organizations and don't understand we need to adapt them to a different set of circumstances. I've seen people out of manufacturing go work in service organizations like insurance companies and just impose, you know, set ways of doing things. You know, can go down the lean toolbox and pick a sub subject and say, you, you must 5S all desks and you must get rid of, you know, all your personal effects. Uh, why? You know, why are we force fitting the uh, application of these tools? We need to adapt them because there's very different circumstances in a service organization than a manufacturing organization. Even between service organizations or between manufacturers, there can be a very different set of circumstances. Um, how do leaders respond to less than expected results? Like I was mentioning a moment ago. You know, we've got to make sure we emphasize it's about the learning, not success and failure. If people see change in the, this lens of success and failure, odds are people are going to avoid failure so they won't even try to change. So the words that leaders use have to be, you know, kind of conjure up positiveness uh, in, in the folks that we're interacting with. Part of that is being patient. The, Effective change takes time. I mentioned sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. That's just the nature of it. You're asking people to change their old habits, sometimes very deep habits. And it's going to take a little while for the new change to kick in where people have developed those skills and it, it becomes a habit. The, the new process changes that have been implemented. That takes time. So leaders have to be patient. So I always tell leaders, don't, you know, the first day we make the changes, put the stopwatches away, put the metrics away for now. Let's just let them settle in. It could be a significant change, even things we don't think are significant. But to the people that have been doing the work for long periods of time, they've got deep rooted habits and it's going to take a little bit of time for them to create new habits. So, you know, kind of reflect on you or others you interact with, particularly in leadership roles. Is there a tendency to focus on the negative, maybe even unintentionally? Uh, because if we do, uh, people are having negative responses and they're not going to want to repeat that. The first three, quote unquote, laws lead to or allow for really the law of habit or habits to form. It's the consequence of the laws of readiness, exercise and effect. Without one, you probably will not have learning. Learning will stop, will cease. And this is the ultimate goal of learning, to create the desired habits, whether for skills for a particular job or for, as I've been mentioning several times, problem solving and process improvement. So what does it take to create habit? Studies have shown typically two months of daily practice is required to begin to create a habit. It won't be deep rooted, can easily be uh, substituted with the old habit. You know, people will kind of go back to their old ways, uh, particularly under pressure. Uh, but generally speaking, about two months of daily practice. You can do this with anything. Do it with brushing your teeth. If you're a righty, you know, try it with your left hand. And then see how long it takes before you don't have to think so deeply about it. And most people say, you know, brush your teeth, say, twice a day or minimally twice a day. It'll take probably a good month to two months before it becomes, uh, begins to create a habit. Not a deep rooted habit. You can kind of go back, snap back real quick to your old habits. 
So when I tell uh, organizations and leaders of organizations, this is what it really takes. Two months of daily practice. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. So if we're doing something, you know, practicing once a week, this is going to take a heck of a lot longer than nine months. So we need to be understand this so we can have reasonable expectations. And until habits are formed, the learning is temporary. Until deep habits are formed. So when push comes to shove, people will go back to their known and familiar way uh, because the that new habits have not deeply formed. So if we don't provide people with adequate, sufficient, many, many opportunities to practice, the habits will never form. It'll take a very long time to do so. Uh, and even as they begin to, we have to understand they're temporary in nature. That's why the A of PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, uh, Dr. Deming, who brought that to the world, always said, you know, you have to put a control plan in as part of act to make standard to keep looking at the process and make sure until you're certain that people have truly changed their habits and the process changes have taken hold uh, and will sustain over time. So that's pretty much it uh, to summarize. Learning is about connecting. Teaching is the arrangement of situations which will lead to desirable bonds and make them satisfying. Again, we have known this for a hundred years. So my question to organizations is always, given what we just discussed, are you arranging the proper situations and conditions for effective and efficient learning? And to get you to think and reflect, consider the meaning and the intent, intent of those laws, the laws of readiness, exercise, effect, and ultimately leading to the law of habit. So I ask you all to reflect on your own organizations or even your personal approach to learning and how they match up or not match up with what we discussed in this webinar. Learning is a fun thing, it should be a positive experience. This is a quote I've been carrying with me since the early 1980s from Aristotle, to be learning something new is the chief pleasure of mankind. Didn't have a lot of opportunity for Aristotle to have fun, I guess, but uh, just kidding. You know, people like to learn uh, as long as it's the proper conditions are in place and it's a positive experience. So that is our webinar. Thank you, Drew. Thanks for your thought leadership and for sharing today with us. That was really interesting. And thank you for taking your time out of your day. Uh, as mentioned earlier, you will receive an email shortly with a link to the recording. Please share this with those who might find this information useful. And just a final reminder, visit leanfrontiers.com forward slash L-A-N-S registration forward slash to learn more about Lean Leadership Week, which takes place September 12th and 13th in Austin, Texas. Thanks again, Drew, and thanks to everyone who participated in today's webinar. Have a great day.